if nothing else, I think that, uh, you know, mathematics can serve as a nice kind of escapism from the, uh, you know, scary or, or concerning developments that are happening in the real world. And I know I've said that in the past, but this is a perfect example. This is a perfect time <laughs> that exemplifies that, I think. So let's get to it. And if that's not sublime, if that's not amazing, then I don't know what is. Greetings, everyone. This is All Algorithms Equal. And uh, it's been quite a while since my last video. Um, most likely, this is going to be the first video I publish since the pandemic started. So, yeah, these are some uh, challenging times that we've been living in. And I hope that you're doing, you know, as well as you can be. I hope, certainly hope that you're safe and still healthy. But uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, try not to waste too much time here and uh, get straight to the point. Now, I prepared some LibreOffice uh, presentation slides, so let's get straight to it, shall we? So, here we have a rectangular geometry problem. Uh, and this is a response to uh, a problem that one of my internet friends sent me uh, about four months ago. In the original problem, uh, my, my internet friend got back to me and told me that his, his teacher claimed that he made an error and that the problem, in fact, was not solvable. I am here to actually change or, ch or to challenge that assertion because I believe it is solvable. And without further ado, what, is, what does the problem look like? Well, here it is. We are given a rectangle here. It's basically split up into three component right triangles. You know, we, we have this V structure, basically. It's a V formed by line segments coming from the vertices. And actually, you, you can just see it on screen. Um, we have this rectangle A, B, C, D, and D, E, that length, is given to us, it's one centimeter in length, and then this other length, BE, which is a, uh, it's one of the diagonal line segments that are drawn in, that one has a length of five centimeters. And the, the objective, in the end, is to find the measurement of angle BEC, or we can just call that theta. So I should pause for a moment here, because if you want to solve this problem yourself, I encourage you to do so. And, and the next slide has hints. If you haven't already, now's your Last warning. I'm going to do a countdown and then move on to the next slide. Okay. Three, two, one. So here, basically, I drew in some additional lines, well, one, one additional line, uh, and also defined some variables here, x, y, and z. So y is probably the simplest one to define because it really is simply the height of the rectangle. It's equal to AD or BC if you want to think of it that way. But uh, I also drew in that line, which is the altitude of that center triangle, perpendicular to DC and goes through E. You know, it's basically the same idea. Then we have X, uh, which I define to be basically equal to EC. And that might be counterintuitive, but basically I just wanted to attach it to or, or associate it with the width of the rectangle. We already have the height. Now I want the width. Okay, well, we already know part of the width. We know that DE equals 1. But we don't know the entire width of the, of the rectangle. So what I said was, okay, let the width be equal to 1 plus x. There you go. So AB equals 1 plus x. For all future reference, that'll be, the, that'll be true. And then finally, Z, uh, basically... We know almost all of the lengths of the, or, or at least we have a, a representation for all of the uh, hypotenuses of these right triangles, except for the one on the left. And the, the one on the left, I just define as Z or Z. So that's AE. Z equals the length of the segment AE. So now let's get to the derivation because this is where the, this is where the fun part starts. Basically, we can do manipulations with all of these variables, and we end up with a solution. So first, let's consider this left-hand uh, triangle, shall we? Well, in that case, 
we have a right triangle. The two, leg, two legs are 1 and y, and then the hypotenuse is z. So from that, we can simply use the Pythagorean theorem and say this, 1 plus y squared equals z squared. A second equation uh, that we can get from the central triangle, and that is right here. Basically, we have um, the two legs being z and 5, so z squared plus 25 equals the whole hypotenuse side length squared, which, as I said, that has to be 1 plus x, that whole quantity, squared. So now we have something to work with. We have two equations and three unknowns so far. Um, I thought, at least, uh, for the sake of presenting this information, and maybe you solved it a different way, and I would be happy to hear how you solved it, but I thought, at least for the sake of, of sharing this information in a, in a digestible way, I figured we would just pause here and work with these two equations. So what, what can we do? We can actually combine them fairly easily. And it's fairly intuitive. We can just substitute for z squared, right? So 1 plus y squared plus 25 equals that whole right-hand quantity. More algebraic manipulation, we can uh, cancel out the 1s, and we get y squared plus 25 equals x squared plus 2x. Okay, that's fine. Basically, now we have a relationship between x and y, and that's pretty good. It's a good start. But it's still not enough to solve the problem, because we have three unknowns and only two equations. But the good news is that we have a right most triangle, uh, another right triangle that we haven't even looked at yet, and that gives us a different relationship between x and y. That is, x is equal to ec and y is equal to bc. So we can use that, those values as the length, the legs of the right triangle here. So x squared plus y squared equals, well then it's just the hypotenuse squared and we're given the, the length of the hypotenuse for the rightmost triangle, that's just 5. So 5 squared is 25, there you go. Now we have two different equations involving x and y, and boom, then we can actually work with them together in order to solve the problem. We can actually get a value for x if we want to. So let's do it. Uh, we have x squared minus 25 being the value of y squared. I'm basically uh, substituting for for y squared. Um, so x, x squared minus 25 equals 25 minus x squared minus 2x. And here we get, uh, uh, yeah, from here we can simply simplify it uh, a little bit, and we get 2x squared plus 2x equals 50, or in other words, x squared plus x equals 25. So that's pretty cool. Like the, Now this is even more uh, simplified than it was before. We have a simple, concise equation for x, and it is, of course, a quadratic equation. So what do we do with that? Well, we can, if we, you know, want to be precise about it, if we want to be, uh, you know, make sure that we get a solution, well, we'd use the quadratic formula. So let's do that. x squared plus x is 25. There you go. Rearrange it. Then, boom, we can use the quadratic formula. And just as an exercise, you can verify that this is true. I don't want to spend too much time on it. It's negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 101 over, all over 2. And uh, at this point, you may be wondering, hang on, plus or minus? Does that imply that there's two different solutions? Well, no, as a matter of fact. You'd think, you'd think it would work with two solutions, but in this particular case, we at least know it's a geometric problem. It's not purely an algebraic problem, it's a geometric problem, so we know that the value of x is equal to ec. And what is ec? Well, what are the constraints on it? It must be greater than zero. We know that. If this structure actually exists, the lengths have got to be greater than zero. So, does this have any solution that, e that it is greater than zero? Well, Let's, I just have a, an animation here. This is our constraint that EC must be greater than zero. So we have two solutions. Is, is at least one of them greater than zero? Well, yes. Negative one plus the square root of 101 all over two. That one is greater than zero. Question is, um, how does that help us exactly? 
Well, the goal, the original goal, is to find the value of this, this angle, the measurement of this angle, theta. Well, what do we know? We know that theta is a part of a right triangle where the hypotenuse is 5, and we also know the value of x, one of the legs. Well, in that case, we can use simple right triangle trigonometry and determine that theta must be the arc cosine of x over 5. So cosine theta equals EC over EB, that you know adjacent leg over the hypotenuse. So the cosine of theta must be x over 5. Now we can do the final step and express theta as the arc cosine of this. It's basically square root of 101 minus 1 over 10, because we're dividing it by 5, and it was already a, you know, divided by 2. So now we can rewrite this a little bit. I actually wanted to try to be a little clever about it. And, uh, you know, express it in a more concise way. Um, and then you can express it this way, which I think is kind of a clever way of expressing it. I mean, it looks a little bit neater to me, but maybe I'm just OCD or something. But it's the arc cosine of the square root of 1.01 .01 minus 0.1. Boom. That's pretty cool. Now that is a, is a concise solution that's worth, you know boxing or circling or putting in bold that is a nice solution that's you know a, an, an accurate precise expression for the value of theta so now there's a deeper meaning in this problem that i want to sort of highlight why this problem you know why did i choose this problem why is it so interesting to me and and why should you be interested well Here's a deeper meaning. This is actually an image that I wrote up many, many years ago. A meme or a, a picture that I made <laughs> uh, eight years ago or, or almost ten years ago. Beginning with segment AB below, construct, using a compass and a straight edge, a segment that has the length of the square root of AB. And it, it turns out that this is possible. You can construct a length with a, you know, with a square root of a given length using simply a straight edge and a compass. And that's pretty cool. And there's actually an even deeper meaning behind that when you learn field theory um, and when you learn about constructible numbers. And I hopefully will talk about that later in a future video. But to solve this problem, Descartes apparently did the following. He extended the segment AB to the left by one unit and defined a new point. C. C being exactly one unit to the left of point A. And then he constructed a circle whose diameter had uh, the endpoints C and B. So we have this outermost circle, which I have in the, you know, in the diagram on the right. Then he constructed a segment that is perpendicular to CB that passes through the point A. So that's basically just, you know, that, that's a rather simple construction in, uh, in Euclidean geometry. But the point at which this segment intersects the larger circle is the relevant point here. I call that point I, and it, it's provable that AI equals the square root of AB. So in this case, we have, you know, one side length that f is actually the square root of different side length. And that's pretty damn cool, if I do say so. And how is this relevant? Well, in fact, it is perfectly relevant. As you can see in this, this diagram on the right, it overlaps perfectly with the problem that we're given. Because we're given a side length that has a, a that is exactly equal to one, one centimeter on the left. And that's on the left triangle. And then, of course, everything else is superfluous. It doesn't really actually matter what the length of that, the, that other hypotenuse is. It happens to be 5 centimeters. That doesn't even really matter because all that really matters is that it's a rectangle. You know, we're constructing a line that's perpendicular to the base of the rectangle through that point. That, that is uh, the side length. It, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a segment length that's equal to the height of the rectangle. 
So this overlaps perfectly with this construction. And you might be thinking to yourself, hang on a second. If this is in fact true, that there's a, a correspondence between this construction and this rectangle problem, what exactly does that mean? Are you telling me that y is equal to the square root of x? In other words, the height of this rectangle is equal to the, the square root of the width minus 1? So y is the square root of x? Is that basically what you're saying? How could that be true? Well, let us verify it. Let's find out. You can rewrite this, you know, simplify more, and you get uh, square root of 101 over 2 minus 1 over 2. Okay. Then what? Well, then we notice something, don't we? <laughs> I have grave news for you. Actually, it's not grave news. It's, it's good news. This one right here. Boom. The point is, this value of x matches precisely what we get on the right-hand side of that last line. They're exactly equal. So that's pretty damn cool. Because y squared equals x. And if that's not sublime, if that's not amazing, then I don't know what is. y squared equals x. Such a simple, beautiful equation that we see falling out of these very simple um, choices that we made in our geometry problem. And they tell us just, you know, it's just such a simple truth, an algebraic truth that you probably did not expect when you first saw the rectangle, right? It's amazing. It just, it's beautiful and amazing. And this is a perfect example of, you know, the, uh, the unexpected ways where geometry and algebra intertwine, I think. It's just pretty cool. Actually, very cool. So thank you very much for watching. And a special thank you to Megumin Nim who uh, shared this problem with me.